Hey everyone, this is episode 55 of Get Your Tech On, our show on all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volp, founder of The Volp Firm and Nimble This. Today we're going to cover common misunderstood RF measurements. Yes, it happens to all of us. Is it 10 log? Is it 20 log? 3 dB? Power splitting? Where's it all come from? It happens to all of us. We mess it up. But we're here to get you through the, some of those trouble problems. We also have our chat window on. Let me get that started. So start our chat. Uh, so feel free to ask questions on the chat window, and we'll go ahead and go through those questions. We've got some great guests on today. We have Ron Rannick up with us. So Ron, thanks for joining us. Please go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone. Hello, everyone, and thanks for taking time out of your schedules to join today's get-together. Uh, I'm uh, a longtime cable guy, started in the industry back in 1972, and, and uh, am with uh, Cisco in the role of a, what's called a technical marketing engineer. Uh, I've been with Cisco coming up on 20 years, um, and I'm happy to be here, very active in SCTE, and uh, also been writing in communications technology and broadband library and other publications over the years, so some of you may have seen the name there. So, uh, pleasure to be here today. Thanks, Ron. Also with us is John Downey. John, please also introduce yourself. Well, Ron, when you started, I was five years old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm it, only it's, uh, nine. That's pretty good math, huh? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, 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 uh, I think it's ironic that uh, you know cable was started in what 1948. So we're 62 years in, and we're still talking about RF. <laughs> and uh, I mentioned this, I think, on our last uh, hangout was RF is sexy again. So if we go uh, ex extended spectrum DOCSIS or extended spectrum HFC, whatever you want to call it, and go to 1.8 gigahertz, RF is becoming uh, something we can't forget. Uh, so, and everyone knows me on this this podcast because we've been doing it. What episode is this, Brady? This is 55, like or 55th episode. Cool. Wow. I don't think you've missed a single one, John. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the first couple. <laughs> yeah, well, no, you were you were on from the very beginning, man. So we oh we really here. <laughs> yeah, you're on the very first one. So, all right. So before we get started, I have a math quiz for you guys. I think you're going to find this one kind of interesting. Um, I'll put up the slide. So here's the math quiz. Um, and so those watching on the podcast, uh, I'll, I'll describe what the math quiz is. Uh, it shows starting from left to right, 8 divided by 2, parentheses, 2 plus 2, and parentheses. So it's kind of a tricky one here, guys. Um, uh, I would say, you know, the first thing we have to say is I'll give this one, you know, what would Ron say? Ron, do you have a, an answer to this? <laughs> um the answer is, is is a bit of an it depends, and I've seen this one posted on social media before. And people yes. pop the question, and say that this, you know, this is one of those hard questions that 99% of the people can't get right. And I I seem to recall reading that a, a professional mathematician had looked at this and said there's there's a couple ways to to um, solve the, the equation. And uh, at first glance, one would say, all right, the two plus two equals four. Two times uh, four is eight, and eight divided by eight equals one. Um, so that would be the that would be one answer. Yes. And, and so we actually, that if, you, if we did this on uh, two different calculators, there's uh, one here showing a Tech TI-84 calculator, the other showing a Casio calculator. So the Casio came up with one, as what you're saying, and, but the TI-84 came up with 16. So even, even two different calculators, which you say, hey, a calculator is going to calculate it right, two calculators side by side came up with different answers. And so it goes down, and, and so I was, I was kind of surprised by this. It, it depends on the way you learn the math. And so, yeah, you're right. This, this did make its way around social media. And there's uh, the one way is the PEMDAS method, um, which I think is the, the method that I learned and probably all of us learned growing up, where it tells you the way that you do uh, ex, um, parentheses. So you do the parentheses first, then you do the exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. But the other way, which is being taught to um, the younger generation today, is the Bode mass method, uh, where the order is brackets, orders, division, multipl multiplication, addition, subtraction, which has you come up with a 16 rather than the answer of 1. So 
um, I thought I thought that was interesting because we're talking about you know some of the challenges that we have in uh, just in our own industry with with you know some of the things that we go through and now we throw in this new uh, <laughs> challenge of just doing arithmetic and multiplication. Well, that goes division. back to the comment I made that professional mathematicians said there are a couple ways that 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 equation can be solved. Yes, yes, so absolutely. The so old-fashioned way I learned, and I think most of the, I think probably all three of us on this call learned, is yeah. the answers. Yeah. And, right, you can also, and, and that would be considered, what, a mnemonic? Like memorizing a... Oh. Uh, a <laughs> I thought you were going to go to an initialism. For the method, yes, that's yeah. right. I would just call it the right way, but... <laughs> 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 so, all right, so, so moving on to the main topic, you know, commonly understood... RF measurements, which, and I have to say, you know, when I started in in the industry, Ron, I actually looked to you for a lot of this stuff because I was I was trying to figure out you know, how how to do a lot of things in the RF world. And at the time, you were the person that was writing a ton of articles about how to do RF measurements, what is MER, what is SNR. So uh, at the at that time, you were kind of like my idol because you were the guy that knew everything. And you still are I the still guy that knows everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, it's awesome to have you on and 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 to talk about some of this stuff. So, I, you know, I, I I thought we'd just start off talking about some basics and stuff. And uh, you know, a lot of things I see people say is like, you know, what's the difference between dB and dBmV and dBm? So I, I throw this one out there as even a starting point. And interestingly enough, my very first job inter- interview, that was a question that was posed to me: What is a dB? So I'll throw that out to you guys. You know, what's a dB? Well, that's that's a good question too. And there's there is unfortunately a lot of confusion about the world of decibels. Um, I've written extensively about this over the years in both communications technology and more recently in broadband library, and have spoken about it in a number of seminars over the years. Um, but we have to use the decibel really as the foundation for the mathematics of cable, or at least a lot of the mathematics in cable, because so much of what we do with um, analyzing network performance and distortions and signal levels and other things all come back to a common base and that's the decibel. Um, the decibel by itself is merely an expression of, of two power levels. That's it. It's the ratio of two power levels. Um, you can say, for example, uh, you've got a stereo in your house that's 50 watts and your neighbor um, has a stereo that's 100 watts. What's the difference between the two power levels in dB? Well, the answer is 3 dB. Um, and we're looking at the ratio of two power levels. And another example um, that helps to emphasize the point that it is merely a ratio is if you have a local radio station that you like to listen to that uh, is transmitting with, say, 20,000 watts of power, and they put a new transmitter in to boost their power to 40,000 watts, what's the, the difference in decibels? And there again, the difference is 3 dB. Or if you want to be more accurate about it, it's 3.01 dB. But it's about 3 dB difference between the two. And, and of course, people immediately think, well, wait a minute. There, the difference between one of them is 20,000 watts, and the difference between the other pair of, of power levels is 50 watts. It has nothing to do with the absolute values. It's, it's merely ratios. Where the confusion comes into play is when we tack a reference onto the end of decibel. So we, the one commonly used in the cable industry is dBmV, or decibel millivolt. That's what we use to express power in terms of voltage. Um, because you look at the MV, which is an abbreviation for millivolt, and people think, well, it's, it's all about voltage. And it's, it is sort of. But uh, because logarithms and, and, and um, as they apply to the world of decibels are ratios of power, we can use a little mathematical tinkering to, to also measure voltages. Uh, but in this case, dBmV is, a, is a, an expression of power in terms of voltage. Um, it is incorrect to say that the signal level at the output of an amplifier is 48 dB or the, or the input to the cable modem is minus 2 dB. You, that doesn't mean anything. You've got to tack on the reference. So the correct levels would be expressed in dBmV or decibel millivolts. And there are a lot of others. Uh, and John can comment on dBm and perhaps dB microvolts uh, that are also used. But, but that's the basis of what we do in cable is, is the decibel. So those are the, the, the two starting points that it's important to understand. We can express loss in dB. We can express gain in dB. We can express things like signal-to-noise ratio, carrier-to-noise ratio, distortion ratios, um, noise figure, and other things in dB. But when it comes to, measure, to expressing signal levels, you've got to tack on the reference after dB, in, uh, in this case, dBmV. 
Yeah, so John, you do a lot of traveling. Do you, where do you run into like DB microvolts or DBM or anything else like that? So it, it, you know, a lot of times in Europe, they reference to a microvolt. Micro is 10 to the minus 6, whereas millivolt is 10 to the minus 3. So that's a, a 1,000 difference. And because everything in DBMB and voltage is a, is a 20, uh, how would you say that, Ron, a, uh, a function of... Um, 20x instead of 10x. Power is 10, but micro, uh, voltage is 20. Well, in this case, dB microvolt is is. Uh, what I'm is getting at is 20 as you, times as you know, 30 is 60. Commonly used in Europe, but if you want to convert dB microvolt to dB millivolt, you have to add 60 to the dB. And that's what I was number. getting at. It's because right. voltage is a 20 uh, 20x function, and if you look at micro versus milli, that's uh, three zeros. Three times 20 is 60. So that's how you get the the quick conversion, right? dB microvolt to dB millivolt is a difference of 60. Yeah, so if I have 100 dB mu V, it's 40 dB MV. Right. And there's another good point that, that you just mentioned. When you're when you're adding in the world of decibels, let's say um, you have a, a level of, of plus 2 dB MV and another level of plus 10 dB MV. What's the difference? The difference is not 8 dBmV, as you might think. 8 dBmV is a measure of an absolute signal level. The difference is 8 dB. So would so you say that anytime you talk about gain and loss or differences, you would just say dB because it's a right. ratio. But that's if you're right. talking about absolute level, it has to be referenced to something. So it's either and, dBmV, and it's, dB mu V, or dBm, right? And dBm it, really is dBmW, but we dropped the W, correct? That's right, and uh, and I know in the past some references did state dB dB milliwatt because the m in this case is milliwatt, so uh, dBm is another is another measure of power. And interestingly, even though we often say that say dBmV or dB microvolt is is a uh, an absolute measure of power, technically speaking, it's a ratio to a reference. So when I say plus two dBmV, we're actually saying that the that the power is two dB higher than the zero dB reference, or in this case, 13.33 nanowatts, which is what zero dBmV equals in a 75 ohm impedance. So when we're talking about power and we talk about like, you know, taking the power and cutting it in half, I think it's interesting uh, to understand that when it happens, like say when we take a, a coax cable, plug it into a two-way splitter, we have two coax cables coming out of that two-way splitter, um, understanding how that splitting of power occurs. So, you know, basically what's the difference when you come into the two-way splitter and go out of the two-way splitter? A two-way splitter is a power divider. And in, in the case of the two-way splitters used in the cable industry, they we assume that they have balanced outputs. What that means is RF power goes into the input port and is split evenly um, between the two output ports. So the, the RF power at each output port of a two-way splitter is half the power of what's present at the input. Uh, in other words, it's 3 dB less than the input. Uh, people would say, well, wait a minute, um, we normally see 3.5 to 4 dB. Why, why that little extra amount? And that has to do with, with um, a couple things. First of all, the, the power split does, in fact, reduce the power by half. The reason we see another half to a dB of additional loss is because of additional loss primarily in the very, very small wiring used in the toroidal transformers inside the splitter. Because they're extremely small gauge wires, their effective cross-section um, at, at, at RF um, or at, at AC is less than their DC resistance or their DC cross-section, equivalent cross-section, um, because of skin effect or skin depth. And that means that there's loss um, there's additional loss in that wiring um, on the toroidal transform, and it's really, really, really tiny wiring. And there can also be a tiny bit of loss um, in the inefficiencies of the, of the, tor the ferrite toroids themselves. But that, that that additional loss of a half dB or so um, is is a result of of the additional loss inside the internal circuitry. But but it's a it's a power split, so it's it splits it evenly. If it were a perfect splitter with no additional loss the output would always be 3.01 dB on each port lower than what's present at the input port. So if I turn that splitter around and I run two coax cables into the input of that splitter, does that mean I can get 3 dB back? There's an, it depends. Um, <laughs> the splitter has insertion loss going, the same insertion loss going both directions. Um, if you have, but if you plug the same signal or, or Two, let's say two CW carriers on the same frequency um, with the same phase, 
they'll combine in the splitter and they will add in phase and you will have approximately 3 dB more signal power at the common port, in this case what used to be the input port, than you do at the, at the two output ports, which are now being used as input ports. Um, that's why splitters can be used as combiners. But if you have signals on different frequencies and, and the, the phase is not related, then, um, then you'll see that same insertion loss to roughly 3.5 dB going back the other direction. So okay. no magic going on. Good old, good old basic physics at work. Yeah, yeah. All right, so so now I think we're getting into power levels. Um, you know, a lot of times when we look on a spectrum analyzer, we see like analog signals and QAM signals, and or you know, let's say we we have QAM signals in the outside plant, and we're told that we are supposed to have those QAM levels lower than the analog levels by some amount. And and so why is that? And, and but we're told that the power is all the same. And why is it that the analog sig levels are the same power as the QAM channels? And we you know we put those QAM channels six to ten dB lower than the analog channels. So, tackle that, John. Before, and before you get there, I wanted to go back on the uh, you know signals have frequency, amplitude, and phase. Phase is timing, right? Uh, sinusoidal waves, uh, three hundred sixty degrees of phase. So a little experiment I've done is I've taken a signal source from a piece of coax, split it with a two-way power splitter, an RF splitter, if you will, and combine it again with another splitter backwards. Now, the combining I did with a three-foot piece of cable on one end and a two-foot piece of cable on the other end. Because that two-foot was exactly 180 degrees difference from the three-foot, at the other output, I got zero. So basically, if you can add a signal back at a phase, kind of like noise reduction, uh, you should get almost infinite loss. <laughs> I don't know if you say infinite loss, but you could basically cancel the signal. Isn't that kind of what so they do with like Bose headphones with noise with yeah. uh, noise cancellation? The active noise. You remember feed forward circuitry way yeah. back in our C core days? Yeah, and the old amplifiers running distortions out of phase back into itself. Yep. When you, when you combine two signals of equal amplitude but opposite phase, they, they cancel. And I, and theoretically, there's nothing left after you after they cancel. Exactly. So I, I thought that was interesting, you know, understanding phase and uh, time and, and length, length of co cable, right? Um, going back to your analog to QAM, if you looked on a spectrum analyzer, we know there's a lot of misconception about looking at a spectrum analyzer if you're just looking at it reference-wise. And all the levels are based on really the RBW, the re resolution bandwidth filter. Most times the default setting is 300 kilohertz RBW. So basically that's a filter that's rolling across the screen, grabbing energy as it goes. So you're really only showing that much reference level at a time. So if I were to look at an analog channel, channel two, if you will, 55.25 video carrier frequency, and a QAM channel right next to it, on a spectrum analyzer, it should be about 20 dB lower. It should appear about 20 dB lower. Because if I want the analog and QAM to be 6 dB absolute power difference, because that QAM is only seeing 300 kilohertz from the resolution bandwidth filter, there's about a 13 dB correction factor there. So appearing 20 dB lower is actually 60 dB lower if your RBW is 300 kilohertz. What's RBW? Basically, I'm taking 10 times the log resolution bandwidth filter. So if I take 10 times the log of 6 megahertz, Ron, you might say the symbol rate of 6 megahertz really is 5.4, uh, and divided by 0.3. In the, in the conversion. So, so 0.3 would be the 300 kilohertz RBW. You end up with about a 13 dB uh, correction factor. So if I took a analog and a qualm that was 20 dB difference, add the 13 correction factor to get the real power of that qualm, it's 60 dB lower. And that's what we wanted was the qualm to be about 60 dB absolute power difference from an analog channel. You now, back in the 64 qualm, it was 10 dB. It was 6 to 10. We went to 256 qualm. We knew it had a higher MER requirement to get good performance. So we always said that about 60 dB lower than the analog. And and the the, the question the, there's another question that does come up that's related to what John just said and that that has to do with um, lower than what um, when we talk about a let's say a QAM signal being set 6 dB lower than analog video levels what does that mean um, when we measure 
the signal level of an analog TV signal's visual carrier. We're actually measuring what's called its peak envelope power. If we measure a quam signal's power, we're measuring something called digital channel power, which is the average power um, integrated across the entire occupied bandwidth. So that's the that's the power in the entire six megahertz occupied bandwidth of the of the quam signal. While in the case of of the visual carrier, the peak envelope power is the average power of one cycle during the modulation crest. Modulation crest in, a, in an analog video carrier occurs during sync peaks. So during the sync peaks, when we talk about peak envelope power, it's the average power of one cycle during the sync peak. And what we're doing when we set the QAM signal's um, power or level relative to a video carrier is we're setting the, the digital channel power or the average power of the QAM signal 6 dB lower than the peak envelope power of the um, the video carrier or the analog video carrier, and what that what that results in then is the peak envelope power of, of the two being roughly the same, because the the QAM signal that we're dealing with is we're measuring it in terms of of average power, but it also has peak power components, and then, of course the the video carrier has peak power components too, but that's not what we're looking at. But we we do all this to make sure we don't clip downstream lasers. That's a that's a big deal because if you get if you get the you take into account the peaks or the peak power of that QAM signal, it can be 6 to 12 dB higher than the average power. And more or less figure around 5 to 6 dB most of the time. Um, so that, that way you get the, the power ratios just right so you don't wind up clipping those downstream lasers and causing oddball bit errors coming out of the node. Yeah, I mean, that brings up a good point is now that we're activating a lot more spectrum with DOCSIS 3.1 OFDM, OFDM um, some people were forgetting to derate the levels going to their analog lasers. So they could get laser clipping on the downstream and not realize it. You know, most times we worried about upstream laser clipping because of ingress and power loading and more upstream traffic causing power loading, but downstream loading as well, right? I mean, if I go uh, with more OFDM and also more single carrier qualms in addition to video, granted we're dropping them about 6 dB compared to analog. So hopefully when we add more, it's not adding total power, but it is adding some total power. And 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 we know some customers that will run the OFDM maybe a little bit hotter than the single carrier qualms, just to get better performance and be able to run higher modulation with DOCSIS 31. So I mean, higher power, more spectrum, more total power into the lasers. You know, I would hope that most people get away from analog lasers, but <laughs> it is what it is. There's a lot of them out there. And you bring up a good point, John. It, I think a, a, hypothetical, a hypothetical example might be a cable operator that's got 60 active channels today and you know, in some empty spectrum that's not being used, and they pop in a 192 megahertz wide DOCSIS 3.1 OFDM signal. That OFDM signal is the equivalent of adding 32 new channels. So if you add 32 channels um, set to the same per 6 megahertz power level as the existing 60, that does have an impact on total power at the present at the input to the laser. And if the if the downstream optical links were were tweaked a with the the input power set a little on the high side to get good performance at the node, um, you pop in the equivalent of 32 more channels uh, by adding that one OFDM signal. You may well push the laser over the edge and and cause either prefect bit errors or or even postspec bit errors. Um, showing up in the in the downstream coming out of the out of the node, so it's important to optimize uh, the levels going into the downstream lasers when that the DOCSIS 3.1 signal is added to the spectrum. It's it's just like adding a bunch of new channels. So be before we get, I, I like the FEC. We're going to get into FEC errors shortly, but we have a question from a listener, which is something else I want to cover too. Really good question from Rick Yuzi. He says, I, a question I have about SNR and MER. I've been told that. Uh, both are synonymous, but be but may be different depending on the situation. Are they different, and how, or is it just a term that people are using in their specific role? Oh, this is one of those that, that gets gets my favorite answer. It depends. <laughs> um, what would Ron first say? of all the concept of SNR, which is an abbreviation for signal to noise ratio, in in the world of telecommunications. Um, can be very, very generic in that it can reference the, the amplitude or the ratio of the amplitude of some signal to the amplitude of noise. Um, in the cable industry, we've generally used SNR, at least historically, to reference the baseband signal-to-noise ratio of, of, say, analog video. 
And, and, and let me just let me ratio, just uh, ask CNR. when you say baseband, what what define the, baseband, oh, baseband for people? I think a, that's a, a little confusing. Say, raw, say that, that's a good question, Brady. Uh, the raw video before it's turned into an RF signal. So we take a um, video from a, a camera or a, the output of a of a video playback source like a you know DVD player or something, or even raw but audio, the video, right? Uh, and, and along with audio, but the, but the baseband signals would be the original video and audio signals. We plug them into a um, the equivalent of an RF transmitter, a modulator, and it converts the the R the baseband signals to RF, and more specifically, the the RF coming out of the modulator or signal source is varied. Um, somehow to represent the original signal. You know, amplitude is varied, the frequency is varied, or the phase is varied. Um, anyway, that's so that's that's what that's what that part means. Now, where let's see, where was I going with that? <laughs> I got I got, SNR, I got MER, the difference. Thank you. Um, anyway, so carrier to noise ratio is a is what's called a, a a measurement done in the RF domain, and that's a measure of the ratio of the amplitude or power of an RF signal to the noise in the spectrum, usually defined with the noise specified in some bandwidth, um, usually equal to the modulation bandwidth, um, so four megahertz in the case of a, an analog television signal. Um, so if we think about those for a moment and say, well, wait a minute, why do we see a cable modem reporting some value for an SNR measurement when we pull it, or an upstream port on a CMTS reports an SNR number? What is that? That actually is receive modulation error ratio. RxMER. Uh, the the um, circuitry inside of the cable modem that actually computes MER um, does so the same way that the circuitry in the upstream line card in a cable modem termination system does it. That the the way it's computed is the same for all of those. Um, the firmware may be written such that it calls it SNR, but it's actually MER or receive modulation error ratio. So yes. The uh, the terms are are the are synonymous and the same at least when we're talking about um, the digital signals we carry in our network, which are actually analog signals, but um, but the ones we call digital signals. So the SNR and MER or RxMER are this are one and the same thing. Yeah, so really really good explanation, Ron, because I think that's come up so many different times. And uh, uh, thanks, Rick, for asking a question. I think that's really really good. Uh, co uh, that's a coverage really good question. And to add in on that. I had a customer ask, say, uh, all right, SNR, MER, same thing, fine. But why am I not getting an SNR reading on your CMTS for OFDMA or OFDM? I'm like, you got to realize that OFDM, DOCSIS 3.1, OFDMA, upstream DOCSIS 3.1, it's not a single carrier. It's many, many subcarriers. So we can't just arbitrarily give you one MER or SNR reading for the whole thing. You have to look at all of the subcarriers and give individual MER readings. So we might have different commands or different uh, MIBs to query so that you can get the MER of all of those subcarriers. So there's some maybe commands that you used to use on the CMTS or you used to talk to the cable modem to get the information, but it's not that simple, meaning it's not just one channel. Like single carrier qualm, it's one channel. <laughs> You're getting the MER of that one channel, but for Fox 3.1, it could be 8,000 subcarriers in that block, if you will. That's a good point, John. It, it, the the, the subcarriers in an OFDM signal are each a miniature qualm signal. Um, each one is only 25 kilohertz wide or 50 kilohertz wide, but each subcarrier in an OFDM signal is a qualm signal. Uh, so. They, so how do you characterize the MER of that OFDM signal? Well, you can go through and, and uh, look at the MER on each subcarrier. So subcarrier number one is 40 dB, subcarrier number 40 or number two is 40.1 dB, subcarrier number three is 42 dB, and so on across across that that OFDM signal bandwidth. And you got you know either 4,000 or 8,000 subcarriers and 4,000 or 8,000 MER readings. So how do you deal with those? Well, you spit them out in a big long list, which is kind of clunky or cumbersome. Uh, a lot of field instruments will report an average per subcarrier MER. So it actually the, the instrument actually goes through and and looks at all 4,000 or 8,000 or whatever the number of subcarriers is. Looks at the MER on each one of them, uh, adds them all up, divides by the total number, and gives you an average for the whole OFDM signal. And they'll often also spit out the here's the highest MER, here's the lowest MER, uh, 
Um, but it's quite frankly much easier just to plot it on a graph. And a lot of the test equipment that techs use in the field today have a graph of MER per subcarrier. And it's a real handy way to get a, a quick eyeball look at, at what's going on across the entire bandwidth of the OFDM signal. But that's, uh, and that, that too can be considered SNR um, or SNR per subcarrier. But, but going back to the, the, uh, the question, it's uh, SNR, MER can be thought of as the same thing. So, so we know that we can use, we're talking about this MER, modulation error ratio. We know it can be used to, to tell us something about QAM channels, about OFDM channels. But, you know, what, what is that MER really quantifying? And, and do we know if MER is good, does that actually tell us for certain that the, the QAM channel or the OFDM channel is absolutely good with certainty? There's some, some, it depends in there, but what is MER? It's a, it's a ratio. It's, uh, I hear some people call it modulation error rate, but it's actually modulation error ratio. And in its simplest form, it can be thought of as the, as the uh, logarithmic ratio of, of um, average constellation power to average error power. And, and you say, well, what on earth does that mean? Um, to put it in, in terms that might be a little easier to understand, think of it as a measure of the spreading of the, sim the symbol points on a constellation display. Most techs are used to seeing or dealing with um, field instruments that can show a constellation display of the signal. For example, a, a 64 qualm constellation display has 64 points on it and in, in arranged in a square fashion, so eight by eight, you know, eight rows by eight columns. Each one of those points represents an instantaneous amplitude and phase value of the RF signal in a certain time window. And if, if um, there's noise in the channel or, or distortions in the channel, um, it can be the equivalent of, of making um, the, the, uh, the symbol display look noisier than it is because that noise adds randomly with the, the desired RF signal. And you know, depending on the amplitude and phase of the noise relative to the amplitude and phase of the instantaneous value of the RF, um, the ideal RF symbol is no longer at the ideal point. And when you plot a whole bunch of these points for each symbol, you get these little cloud of, a little cloud of symbols at each of the 64 points for, in the case of 64 qualm. The more spread out they are, that means the worse the, um, the MER. Uh, in other words, a lower MER number. So we're taking the average constellation power to the average error power. Um, there's, it really helps to have a diagram that shows it because it's, we're looking at error vectors and other things in there. But think of it as a way of measuring or a, a way of expressing how spread out the constellation points are on the display of, of the, the data constellation. And then uh, it becomes a really, really powerful troubleshooting tool. The higher the number, the better. But it is an average measurement or an average value measured over a bunch of symbols. And uh, good MER doesn't always mean a good signal. Uh, John, you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, so, you know, the this one's interesting because customers will be like, and it used to be RF and IP guys were separate, right? Now they're kind of combined. But they would always point fingers at each other. Like, I got this bad MER reading, the guys that are monitoring the CTS or the cable modems. And they blame the RF guys, the plant guys, that the plant is bad. Well, plant guys are looking at CNR. They're looking at spectrum analyzers. They're looking at stuff like that. So could you have a bad MER, and then you pull up a spectrum analyzer, and it looks fine? Of course. There could be embedded information that's bad. You could have group delay. You could have micro reflections. You could have bad timing. You could have bad software bugs uh, that create poor MER and modem issues, but the plant is fine. So to me... I need to look at a spectrum analyzer, have an idea what the plant's doing, visibility into what the modems are doing, which is MER, SNR, same thing, visibility into correctable, uncorrectable FEC, uh, and there's other parameters that I would track. So there's not one parameter that's going to be your gospel, right? <laughs> and that's what I think what we're saying is, Brady, you kind of alluded to this, was if MER is bad, then the sky is falling. Well, is it or isn't it? Is it a plan issue or not? I don't know. So you have to look at all these things and take them into consideration. Um, we don't normally have one piece of test equipment that does everything. Group delay, micro reflections, timing issues, uh, bad firmware in the modem, um, micro reflection. You know, there's a lot of different things that can occur. Impulse noise, for instance. You can because have MER, MER with impulse yeah, noise, right? Yeah, because MER is...
averaged, I can, and depending on the sweep speed or dwell time of my spectrum analyzer, I might not see impulse noise, but I'll have a lot of uncorrectable FEC. So there's a there's a scenario where if I see uncorrectable FEC incrementing, but no correctable FEC, there's nothing being fixed, and I don't see it on a spectrum analyzer unless I can slow down the sweep speed of my analyzer, and I don't have a bad MER, then in my mind, I might think it might be impulse noise. So that might push me to change the dwell time on my spectrum analyzer, maybe go zero span mode if I'm doing upstream stuff. Um, so that way, if I go slower, you know, typical sweep speed is 20 milliseconds, but if I go 100 milliseconds or one millisecond sweep speed on a spectrum analyzer and, hook, and put peak hold on, you'll capture a lot of impulse noise you didn't know was there. So it, it's, it, I guess, just looking for different things and understanding that, um, not everything will show up on a spectrum analyzer unless you know how to use it. And then there's other parameters on the CMTS that you could track to maybe make some decisions or how to troubleshoot a little bit better. Yeah. So there's all kinds of things that, that are intermittent or bursty that can cause bit errors in the data stream, but yet the MER looks perfectly fine. Yeah. Uh, that's that, you know, laser clipping and impulse noise, as John mentioned, sweep transmitter interference. There's a lot of gremlins that can, can, uh, not have an impact on MER, but can can blow the bit errors out of the water and cause correctable, uncorrectable code word error problems. So uh, this takes us perfectly into the the area that um, for correctable, uncorrectable code word errors um, on test equipment. We have like pre and post BER, some other test equipment. It's called different things. Uh, you know, bit error rate. And we see measurements like you know one times ten to the minus sixth or 1e to the minus 6 they're in you know kind of different formats which is you know really goes into scientific notation but it's kind of difficult to interpret that um, we hear we hear correctable uncorrectable sometimes it's in percentages sometimes it's in scientific notation and you know so i guess the bottom line is what what does this mean these uh, pre and post ber uh, correctable, uncorrectable code words. How do we interpret these? And and I I, I believe, you know there there's also differences whether it's a QAM channel or a OFDM channel uh, for correctable or yeah correctable code words in in particular. So you know is oh. is there a standard? Is there a rule of thumb? What are the best practices? Well, let's start with with BER or bit error ratio. Now it's often called bit error rate, but technically speaking, bit error rate is the reciprocal of bit error ratio. So let's say that that we send a million bits through a, a channel of some kind. And at the other end of the channel, three bits out of the million are received in error. So we've got three broken bits out of a million. The other, the others are, all the others are, are good. Um, the BER is the ratio of, of um, broken bits to the total number of bits transmitted, received, or processed. So the, the BER is, in this case, is 0 .00000. .00000 I got the right number of zeros there, but you know, nobody says, wait a minute, we don't, do we're not going to audit you. <laughs> no, it's usually expressed in scientific notation. So that would be three times 10 to the minus six yep. uh, is the bit error ratio. So, and that just says that three bits out of the, the million bits that were received are broken. So that's BER. Um, in the world of data transmission, we, we need to be able to um, correct as many bit errors as possible going through the channel because the, the channel through which a signal is transmitted is not perfect. There are impairments there. There's, I mean, just, if nothing else, there's noise, um, just plain old thermal noise and you know, amplifiers and, and everything else that we transmit uh, this signal through. But there are all kinds of other impairments. And John mentioned some of them, you know, the impulse noise and, and uh, micro reflections and a bunch of other things. And, and any, any impairment in the channel will degrade the BER, the bit error ratio. So we need some way to to first of all, detect the presence of those errors when they occur. And second of all, we need to figure out a way to, to correct them uh, when they do occur. So how do we do that? Well, it, it, broadly speaking, it's done with something called forward error correction, which is abbreviated with FEC or by the, the abbreviation FEC. And in order to make FEC work in a data signal, uh, the original data bits are transmitted along with some uh, redundant bits that that are used as as part of the the error correction process, and then using some mathematical algorithms in the in the, on the receive side of things, the receiver can can do some cool mathematical tricks and determine 
um, if an error occurred, a bit error occurred, and, and if it did, where in the bitstream did it occur? And depending on the nature of the, the error correction being used, it can correct those errors. Um, so that's a good thing. It helps to improve the robustness of data transmission and makes our data transmission going in the downstream and the upstream a lot more reliable and more robust. Um, when we transmit data through a cable network, we, we take big groups of, of bits and glue them all together to form something called code words. And the, um, so the, just think of a code word as a group of bits. And the, and the decoder um, or the receiver at the other end, uh, the, the decoder is looking at each code word and fixing to the extent it can the bits in the code word. And typically there's a limitation on the number of code words that can be fixed up if they're broken. Uh, because generally speaking, if there are bit, broken bits in the code word, the code word is considered broken. Um, uh, so it's considered errored. So if the the, the, uh, the FEC circuitry looks at that and says, okay, I've, I was able to, I, I mean, I'm, I'm capable of fixing three broken code words uh, in, or three, three broken symbols per code word. And by, by doing that, I, if there are only three symbols that, that are broken, um, and I can fix all three of them, then what you'll see is three correctable code words um, and no uncorrectables because the, the forward error correction was able to patch up and fix everything. But if you have too many code words or too many symbols in the code word uh, broken and the error correction can't fix it, then not only do you have correctable code words, but now you start to see uncorrectable code words. And that means that you've got code words that are broken. They, they couldn't be fixed at all, so they're tossed out. And now you have packet loss. Um, and that's, a, that's kind of the distinction between correctable and uncorrectable code words. Reed Solomon error correction is used with our single carrier QAM signals. It's pretty powerful. It works very well. Um, in the world of OFDM and DOCSIS 3.1, we use an error correction technique called low density parity check. And it's just, it, it was actually developed in about 1960 or 61. Um, but the mathematical computations in it were so complex that, that it, it was kind of put on a shelf as an interesting novelty until um, computational power was, was able to catch up. And of course, nowadays that computational power is inside of a chipset. And it's, it's a really, really powerful form of error correction. And here's where things get confusing because in the world of single carrier QAM with, with Reed Solomon error correction, People are used to say to seeing, hey, I see prefect bit errors, which basically means there are some bit errors before the error correction does its magic. Uh, but I don't see postfect bit errors. I didn't. I need to go out and find out what's causing the prefect bit errors and fix it, because it could mean something's degrading and getting worse over time. Um, if there are postfect bit errors, of course, that means packet loss, and definitely got to fix that. Uh, and that's that's the way we've operated for the last 20 years. You see prefect bit errors, go go find out why and fix them. In the world of uh, DOCS is 3.1 and OFDM, the, uh, the, the correctable code word errors and the uncorrectable code word errors are things that we look at. But in the case of DOCS is 3.1 and LDPC error correction, we can ignore correctable code word errors. Indeed, it's not unusual to see 100% correctable code word errors with LDPC and have no uncorrectable code word errors. Um, the, the presence of correctable code word errors in LDPC based error correction with DOCSIS 3.1 is actually normal um, and expected behavior given the, the MER numbers and carrier to noise ratio values and stuff we deal with in our plants. As long as you don't have uncorrectable code word errors with DOCSIS 3.1, you can ignore um, the correctable code word errors. They, they're basically meaningless and they don't give any indication of how close to the failure threshold you are. Um, now on that subject, um, I'm doing some things with, with cable labs to see if we can come up with some ways to, to maybe better characterize that. But the reality is that the presence of correctable code word errors really doesn't mean anything and can, they can be ignored. Just look out for the, the uncorrectable code word errors. And, and, and then pay attention, of course, to MER per subcarrier because as that approaches the what's called the threshold, uh, that is the MER failure threshold for the modulation order you're using, that can definitely be indicative of a problem. Sure. John, do you have guidance for, uh, say, technicians if they're out making measurements on what would be acceptable, correctable, and uncorrectable code word errors before it starts to actually impact a user, a subscriber? So as, as Ron mentioned, I think it, it uh, needs to be reiterated. With DOCSIS 3.1, don't use correctable FEC as a means of determining there's a problem. 
you're probably going to see 100% correctable FEC. It used to be back in the day with single carrier qualm that once we reached three, four, or 5% correctable FEC, it was a good indicator that we were getting close to probably getting some uncorrectable FEC. And I used to say, you know, uncorrectable FEC is my bottom line. That's drop packets. But there are cases where I have impulse noise and I have uncorrectable FEC. And if I react on that by changing modulation, it might not do me any good anyway because impulse noise typically is very high in power, but it's short in time. So changing modulation for a very sporadic event doesn't do me any good. So many times on the upstream, we say, look at MER and uncorrectable FEC. I personally don't look at correctable FEC either on the upstream. I just feel like if it's being fixed, why am I going to change modulation if it's already fixed? It's corrected. So my bottom line is uncorrectable FEC, that's draw packets. But I need to also look at MER to make sure that I am not changing prematurely. Uh, I want to make sure that my MER and my uncorrectable effects reaches certain thresholds. With that said, as Ron mentioned, correctable effect for 3.1, don't bother. And, and Brady, you work with test equipment, and, and Ron, you as well. I believe test equipment that says pre and post really means corrected and uncorrected. Is that correct? That's Is that totally right? correct. Okay. Because you might see that terminology, right? Pre-BR, post-BR, or pre-FEC, post-FEC. Uh, but for CMTS, from our side, we always say correctable or uncorrectable. So I think they are synonymous. Yeah, Correctable means the, pre. The, the pre-FEC and post-FEC or pre-BER and post-BER that you see in a piece of test equipment, all they're doing is is taking the data from the, the cable modem chipset that's in the in the test equipment itself, whether you, you know it's a... It's a DSAM or a ONU or a VX meter. They basically has a have a cable modem chipset in it. They're taking the readings right out of that of the correctable and uncorrectable fact and just uh, calling it something else. But it's the same thing. Okay. All right. So I have a a, a thought as as Ron was going over correctable uncorrectable fact, and I always felt it was interesting to kind of repeat was if I have ingress on the downstream. All your downstream signals being broadcast out from the head end. Let's suppose there's 10 modems that see that corrupted information because they're all coming from the same common ingress point. All those modems will report correctable and uncorrectable FEC. Because the impairment is at the physical layer, the modems have no idea who that traffic was meant for. Everything's broadcast out from the head end. So if you were to track modem, downstream modem, correctable and correctable FEC, you could have a lot of FEC or uncorrectable FEC on a lot of modems, but maybe those modems weren't meant to receive that information anyway. So the customer never complained. So everything downstream of an ingress, common ingress point, those modems will track correctable and uncorrectable FEC, regardless if it was really affecting him or not, because you don't know whose traffic is whose. But in the upstream, this is interesting because on the upstream, even if it's uncorrectable FEC, and that's the physical layer, layer two, layer three information, you know, the MAC address, the source destination address, you don't know what that is because it was uncorrectable. But on the upstream, everything is timed. Because of the DOCSIS timing, the CMTS can make a decision to say, all right, this packet was corrupted. I don't know who it was for, but I do know what time it came in. So it must have been for cable modem A or was relegated to the cable modem A. So we can track per modem correctable and uncorrectable effect on the upstream pretty accurately, but on downstream, it's a different story. So I think that's kind of uh, useful to, I guess, understand what you're looking at and and uh, why one customer not but might not be complaining, why another one is. On the upstream, it could be individual modem uncorrectable effect because of group delay, which is why, you know, PNM comes into play. I want to look at the pre-equalization information because of micro-reflections, and it is an individual problem. So I could have, and I think this is good too, is all the noise funnels back in the head end, so you say, usually have the same carrier to noise ratio for upstream for everybody, but not the same MER SNR because everybody has different paths. They have different group delay, different micro-reflections, different uh, cavities of, of uh, mismatches, um, bad wiring in the house, you name it. Yep. I, another I point that, on. 
there's another point that goes along with what you just said, John, that, that's, that, that's an important distinction. Um, MER can never be better than carrier to noise ratio. It can't. Um, if, if you've got an instrument reporting better MER than what the carrier to noise ratio is numerically, um, there, there's something going on that's, that's, uh, that's a miss. Um, it's, it's not possible to have MER better than the carrier to noise ratio. So the, the, only, the only correction I would have, not correction, but uh, it depends, would be <laughs> if your CNR was quick enough to capture an impulse noise event and it did a CNR measurement on the impulse noise. Then the CNR could be five dB, but the MER, because it's average, could still be thirty. And, and in that case, I don't think I would call that a carrier to noise ratio measurement. Uh, measurement. Um, the uh, typically what you'll see is the MER is usually a couple dB or so lower than the, or sorry, the carrier to noise ratio is typically a couple dB or so higher than the MER. Uh, but if you've got um, distortions, linear distortions such as group delay in the channel, the MER can be Seven, eight, ten dB worse than the carrier noise ratio. Uh, even you look at the CNR on the spectrum analyzer, say it's really good, but why is the MER trash? Because we're getting hammered by what I like to call invisible impairments, like um, like group delay or or micro reflections, amplitude ripple, that sort of thing. Um, I'll give so you another thing. weird example. Would be uh, two carriers side by side, and because the MER and the chipset should give me the MER of the symbol rate, let's say it's an upstream channel 6.4 megahertz wide, the symbol rate's 5.4. 5 5.12. So there's guard band already in that envelope, if you will, in that uh, upstream channel. But what if the other channel side by side kind of overlaps a little bit? If your CNR measurement is monitoring that overlap, it could look like bad CNR. But the MER might report okay because really we're looking at the MER of this, not of this. Does that make sense? Well, I think it, that, <laughs> yeah, that when we measure carrier to noise ratio, it's important to keep in mind that the the, uh, the carrier to noise ratio is is the ratio of the channel power. So in the case of a qualm signal, it would be the the average power over the entire occupied bandwidth. That is the six megahertz. Um, to the noise power in the symbol rate bandwidth, and that can that one can cause some confusion. Um, the the other piece is that that MER is not a frequency domain measurement. MER is something done in the digital domain. It's computed in the world of ones and zeros, uh, and that's done at the slicer in the in the uh, the digital circuit. So that so that can cause confusion if if people think about MER as being something in a in a certain RF bandwidth because it's in the it's in the bandwidth of the channel because that's where all the data is, but it's not actually a frequency domain measurement. It's it's one that's done in the, the world of ones and zeros. Well, we're getting and it comes back. We're getting into deep into weeds, guys. Spectrum, <laughs> it's getting it deep. comes back to the spectrum analyzer too. What if what if your resolution bandwidth filter is two megahertz, not a three hundred kilohertz wide RBW? A two megahertz RBW will make the qualm channels appear higher and overlap each other because you're looking at the filter response as it scans across the screen of the spectrum analyzer. So if you did a CNR of that, you'd be like, oh my God, this channel is bleeding over into the other channel. But in reality, you're just looking at it incorrectly because you don't understand how a spectrum analyzer works. Well, and, and, and here's a simple, a simple little measurement trick um, that people can use to get a, get a pretty close guesstimate of the carrier to noise ratio of a digital signal. It's the height of the QAM haystack or OFDM haystack above the displayed noise floor. And the assumption is that the spectrum analyzer's displayed noise floor is the cable system's noise floor, not the test equipment noise floor. Um, you don't have to do any bandwidth conversions or anything else. So if you see a, a, a QAM haystack sticking up 40 dB above the, the displayed noise floor, the carrier noise ratio is approximately 40 dB. I say approximately because you know, you're eyeballing it there and it might be you know, within a dB or so different of, of uh, what you're looking at. But that's the, how you can determine carrier to noise ratio on a digital signal. You could get really uh, uh, finicky about it if you want and do use the analyzer, assuming it supports digital channel power measurements. And most, most of the ones made in the last couple decades do. You do a digital channel power measurement of the QAM signal and get that number. And then you turn off the channel and measure the noise floor using the marker noise function of the spectrum analyzer, which does a noise floor measurement in a one hertz bandwidth. 
and then do a logarithmic conversion to um, the the, uh, the modulation bandwidth of the qualm signal, that is the symbol rate bandwidth, and the difference between those two will be the carrier noise ratio in dB. But you don't have to do that with the with um, the digital signals because they're noise like. It's the height of the haystack above the the displayed noise floor. And if you want, if you're uncertain whether the displayed noise on the analyzer is the cable system noise floor or the spectrum analyzer noise floor, briefly disconnect the RF input cable from the spectrum analyzer. The displayed noise floor should drop at least 10 dB. If it doesn't, if it drops less than that, you're seeing um, more spectrum analyzer noise than you are cable system noise. So you want to see that external, you want to see that noise floor drop at least 10 dB to know that you that you're seeing external noise rather than mostly internal noise. All right, guys, we have to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I do want to thank you for our time today. This has been a uh, absolutely fantastic episode. I, I couldn't help but think while we were talking between the three of us, we have well over a hundred years of RF expertise here. <laughs> <laughs> and so, that's that's a lot of run. time. It is. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> <even for Ron. laughs> and Ron's 40, half of it. 40, I just passed the 47 year mark in the cable yep. industry this past October, which is, I look back, think, wait a minute, where, where did all time go? go? Where'd all go? And by the way, pretty much everything that John and I have talked about, um, the, the two of us have, have written articles and papers on these subjects. So if you do a little Google searching, I know there are articles on broadband library, SCTE archives, a lot of the CT articles that I did, well, from 2003 till they ceased publication in 2012. You'll find the CT articles there, and there's a there, there's a lot of stuff that I know I've written on on the decibel DBMV signal level channel power MER. Uh, John's done has done the same. He's written articles, he's written papers, he's they've done you know, PowerPoint presentations. So there's a lot of good material out there between the two of us that covers pretty much everything we talked about. And then uh, Brady, I know you've got a lot of really good reference material on your websites that that people can reference about DOCSIS and, and a lot of the things that we talked about too. So the reference materials out there, if you want to do a deep dive into some of that. And I know on the code word thing, I was confusing, you know, code words and symbols and stuff like that. But I did do an article on, uh, on code words, I think for communications technology. And that article is archived on, on, on uh, the SCTE website. You have to do a little digging for it, but you can find it there. And, and it talks, does a little bit more in depth about the uh, Reed Solomon code words and, and uh, code word errors. Yeah. No, there's a lot of good material out there. Um, you guys want to plug anything that's coming up? Any events or anything like that? Uh, Not yet. Kind weekend. Of a, kind of slow time of year for all of us. I yeah, think, the so. weekend. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Happy the weekend. Friday, guys. <laughs> Starts later today at 5 o'clock. All right. Well, for me, anyway. Again, I want to thank right. you guys. Thanks, Brady, for the opportunity yeah. to, to be here. It's been a lot of fun. No, absolutely. It's my pleasure. It's a great, great episode. Um, thank, I want to thank everyone for listening to the episode. You know, we, we'll be back next month again with a new topic. We try to bring, bring you guys something technical every month. No advertisements, absolutely free. Keep watching. Hit the uh, subscribe button if you like what you see. And uh, subscribe on podcast. This will also be on podcast. So thanks, everyone. So long. Thanks again.